Flying aircraft carriers are featured in some of the most popular science fiction. The Avengers have the Helicarrier, Fallout's Brotherhood of Steel have the Pridewind, and the Empire have Star Destroyers. But the thing is, for the first half of the 20th century, we too had flying aircraft carriers. And they were airships. So what happened? In 1783, the Montgolfier brothers made history when they debuted the first successful flight of a hot air balloon. Several months later, they repeated the performance, this time with actual passengers, a sheep, duck, and a rooster. They flew for eight minutes, traveling two miles in front of a crowd of French dignitaries, including Marie Antoinette and King Louis XVI. The idea caught on, and technology surrounding airships would rapidly progress. A year later, Jean-Baptiste Musnier came up with the idea for the cigar-shaped airship that we're familiar with today, solving the massive problem of steerability. They began using hydrogen as an alternative to hot air, and around the time World War I was ramping up, helium was being produced in larger quantities, so many dirigibles favored it, as it's much less volatile than hydrogen. At the turn of the century, Adolf Heinrich Graf von Zeppelin, or Count Zeppelin, revolutionized the airship game when he introduced the rigid airship, an airship with an internal frame, or as it's commonly known, a Zeppelin. Side note, a Zeppelin is a type of rigid airship built by Count Zeppelin's company, making it the Kleenex to the tissue of rigid airships. Count Zeppelin had seen the use of balloons in the American Civil War as recon units and their use in the Siege of Paris as messengers, and so he was at the forefront of their use in World War I. Biplane technology was also ramping up towards the start of the First World War, but it would be airships that would kill the first people in air raids in 1915. German Zeppelins were much more useful than biplanes in certain areas. They could stay airborne longer, making them better for patrolling defense lines. They could travel much further, higher, and carry much heavier bombs. In fact, Zeppelin raids were so successful that they forced the British to develop better biplanes that could take down the hulking balloons, inadvertently putting the first nail in the airship's coffin. According to an interview in Wired with Jeffrey Underwood, a military historian, they did more damage keeping people awake than actual physical damage, as they scared the living daylights out of the British. The war had proven that airships were very vulnerable to enemy fighter planes. So why not combine the two and give airships their own fighter escort? Why not make flying aircraft carriers? England was the first to attempt it with the 23-class Vickers Rigid Airship, a 535-foot vessel that could carry three Sopith Camel biplanes that would be launched from hooks beneath the ship's hull. The Royal Navy built four of these in 1918, and they saw a bit of action in the final weeks of the war conducting anti-submarine operations in the North Sea. Unfortunately, all four of these flying aircraft carriers were decommissioned by 1920. Fast forward to 1923, and the United States would take the idea of a flying aircraft carrier one step further. They began by testing this parasite fighter program on the USS Los Angeles. And by 1929, they began construction of the USS Acra, the first airship designed from the ground up to be a flying aircraft carrier, and the first to be able to launch and recover its own fighters. It had an internal hangar which could store up to five small fighter planes, specifically five Curtis F-9C Sparrowhawks. The really cool thing is how they got in and out of the airship. When the fighters were returning, the Akron would lower a large metal arm through a T-shaped hole in its hull, and the fighter planes would hook onto a trapeze bar at the base of the arm before being raised back up into the airship. To launch, they would reverse this process, lowering the arm, and the fighter would attach itself to go do battle or reconnaissance. The big advantage airships have over biplanes is that they can stay airborne for a really long time. The Navy planned for the Akron to be a scouting vessel, which could stay airborne for days on end, getting close to the enemy but not close enough to be seen, at which point it would launch its biplanes to do scouting, greatly extending the biplane's range. The ship launched for the first time in September of 1931, and it didn't have a very long life. In February of the following year, it suffered an embarrassment as a test flight caused the ship to break away and smash its tail fin. Several months later, the Akron was docked in San Diego when it unexpectedly kicked up, taking three sailors with it attached to its moorie lines. Two of them fell to their death. On April 3rd, 1933, the fate of the Akron would be sealed. Hit by severe winds off the coast of New Jersey, the ship crashed into the ocean, killing all but three of its 76 passengers, more than double the lives lost on the Hindenburg crash several years later. Around the same time as the Akron crash, its almost identical sister ship, the USS Mackin, launched for the first flight of its also relatively short career. In February of 1935, it too crashed into the ocean, this time after a damaged upper fin gave way and the ship lost too much helium to stay airborne. Fortunately, unlike the Akron, this ship was equipped with life jackets, and all but two of the 83 sailors aboard made it out alive. 
During training exercises, both of the airships were found to be successful at tracking down enemy ships, but highly vulnerable to attack, though neither ship would see any actual combat. Possibly the most notable appearance of the USS Akron was over the Capitol buildings on March 4th, 1933, at the inauguration of President Franklin Roosevelt. The two crashes and the ship's vulnerability made it easy for the Navy to cancel the project. The horrific crash of the Hindenburg two years later would further bury the idea of airships in general. Their limited passenger capacity and thus limited commercial viability didn't help. And the final nail in the coffin would be the rapidly accelerating technology of planes, which could carry many more people at much faster speeds. Also, it is possible that the Earth is running out of helium, making their comeback even more unlikely. Though that is up for debate, as is evident by these two completely contradicting Forbes articles that come up in a quick Google search which I guess makes sense for Forbes. Side note, the Hindenburg was actually filled with hydrogen and not helium because at the time, the United States had a monopoly on the helium market and in an attempt to freeze out the competition, they banned its export. I guess what I find most interesting about this whole thing is that almost a hundred years ago, we were able to build something that we can only build today with CGI or we only choose to build it with CGI, because despite the appeal to our inner romantic, the alternative has been too closely tied to tragedy. I wanted to keep the focus of this video on airships, but I feel like I'm robbing you if I don't tell you about the Russian-made flying aircraft carrier planes that actually fought in World War II. It was called the Zveno Project, and they modified bomber planes to be able to carry up to six small fighters on their wings and back. Similar to how the airships were used to extend the range of their planes, the bomber would fly out into the field and the fighters would detach to carry out their missions. One such mission happened in the opening weeks of the Russian war effort against the Nazis, when they successfully raided a Nazi-allied Romanian oil depot on July 26th, 1941. What do you guys want me to talk about in my next video? Let me know in the comments, and if you haven't already, be sure to click right on my face to subscribe, or at least think about it.